because we were that late. Must have taken longer on our practice than I thought. Let well, people get settled in here. All right, we'll get started. Sorry about the uh, slightly delayed opening there. I lost track of time while I was chatting. Uh, but welcome to day two of the state and regional virtual workshop. Um, for those of you rejoining us from Tuesday, uh, thanks for coming back and taking time out of your day again. And for those of you that are just joining today, welcome. Uh, before we hand it off to our moderator um, in the panel today, I just wanted to cover a few technical logistics. Uh, this is Zoom webinar, so as opposed to Zoom meeting, you can't uh, interrupt. We can't see you. We can't hear you. Uh, if you do want to speak at any point, you can go ahead and raise your hand, uh, and during the Q&A period, we'll, we'll let you speak by just unmuting and announcing you. But otherwise, we're going to primarily be using chat today. Um, just as a, as a reminder, if you want everyone to see your message, make sure you select all panelists and attendees down there in the chat window. Uh, we're going to ask everybody to introduce themselves in a moment here. So by default, it only goes to the panel and no one else will see it except for us. So make sure when you type in there, you select all panelists and attendees. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Jerry Montag. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the uh, State and Regional Virtual Workshop. Uh, I am your ACRO Board of Directors, Vice President for Leadership and Management Development. And what you're going to hear today is from three different authors who wrote chapters for a book that's been uh, tremendously well-received and everything. But before we get started, we would like to know who we're speaking with. So I would like each of you to give me your name, your title, and what state and region you represent. So take it away. Just, just start anybody. Just want to hear all our attendees. And don't be shy. Mike, are we not hearing them? No, like I said, uh, they have to use chat here. Uh, okay. That's fine. One person does have their hand raised, so I will... Uh, Angela Snow, you can unmute yourself and speak if you'd like. Okay. Hi, Jerry. Angela Hi. Snow, um, Carl Sandberg College, um, Assistant Registrar, Coordinator of Admissions and Records, IACRO uh, Communications Manager. Excellent. Nice to see you. Likewise. Anybody else? <laughs> you don't have to be shy. That's okay. <clears throat> Yeah, lots of people are putting in the chat down there. Okay. Um, and I think pretty much everyone, actually, so very good participation so far. Yeah, we can, I think we can move on here. Okay, let's move on. First, I want to uh, thank, uh, it's good to see Melissa Young in the audience. Melissa is the president of uh, Middle States and everything. And just to drop back a little, um, the board uh, is uh, sorry that we cannot be part of in-person uh, presentations at your state regional this year due to the COVID and everything. 
we will participate as much as you'd like us to in a virtual environment. Um, you are a great group and everything, and just continue the success that you do on a daily basis for your state and regional organizations. But Melissa, just a shout out to my friends at the Middle States since I was there two years ago. So let's continue. Um, I want to start by in, um, a little about me. You know, a part of the, um, for those of you who don't know me and everything, I've been a part of ACRO for over 35 years. I've gone to sessions, or I've gone to many, many sessions. I've gotten to know many, many of you and everything. And it's such a great organization. Plus, I've been a part of state and regional organizations myself, including being a president of the FACRO group. And what we wanted to do, we as a board, and just so you know how this whole thing is coming together, the, the ACRO board recommended a couple of years ago from Lara Medley, who was the vice president for, uh, who would then turned it over to Meredith, who became the vice president for leadership management development, who then turned it over to me and said, why don't we come up with the state and regional guide? And the bottom line, if I had to cut through the chase of what we're doing this, uh, this afternoon is, what we found is there is no set document that helps someone in the state and regional level who could see how you do something, how FACRO does something, how GACRO does something, how Middle States does something, how WACRO does something. So the idea behind that was planted, but the idea never really materialized to put together a group of um, uh, <clears throat> leaders of the book, the authors, which is um, <clears throat> Steve Smith and uh, from Adelphi University, and Patty Matheny from the University of Pittsburgh to pull together this book. It then went under the auspices of the State and Regional uh, Committee and everything, of which Michelle Kelly is the chair of this year, and previously uh, Texas Rube was the chair. So what you're going to hear today is the dynamic presentation from authors who wrote information about specific chapters and everything. Now you need to keep in mind that what you have is a handbook, is a guide and everything, and we all do things differently. We all do things differently based on our state and regional size, budget, travel, how we do things. You know, and in talking with Steve and Patty and Michelle and Tex, as this book was under development, it was a challenge. And I do want to thank personally all the authors who got involved, who stepped up to the plate, um, who wanted to write and help spread the word as far as how they do things and everything. So I'm just looking at my notes and everything. So I'm not going to be a long-winded person, which I can do. But I just want to make certain you ask questions. That's what we're here for. Um, this is a guide. It's a guide that's going to be continuously updated over the years. I recommend to the board that we continue adding chapters as needed and everything. So just keep that in mind as we, as we go through these activities. So let me quickly introduce some of the people here that are uh, going to be doing some speaking. First, I also want to, besides thanking Michelle for putting this together, I want to thank Annetta, Tiffany, and Mike from the ACRO office for making this become a reality. I do need to thank the authors. And it's funny, like I said, I've been involved with ACRO for 35 years. Let's take away what the first, for your first speaker was going to be Chris Wank. Uh, Chris is going to be talking about um, association activities. I've probably known Chris for the last eight years since I've been at IACRO. Tix is also, Tix, oh, tech, oh, excuse me, Chris is also a roommate with me. We, we hang out together because sometimes budgets are tight. And that's the whole idea of trying to get more and more people to attend. So Chris, it's good to see you. Um, Carrie Jeffers and I, we go back many, 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 many years when I was at uh, uh, Grand Valley State University. And she's the registrar at Macomb County Community College. And I met her through the State Association. I also knew that Carrie had the best and outgoing president I've ever met my entire life. Uh, um, and, you know, I saw, I really appreciated getting to know you, Carrie, and getting to know you as part of the uh, Michigan group and everything. Um, Carrie's going to be talking about leadership uh, developments. And then I'm also going to introduce Julie Fell, who's going to be talking about administrative practices. And not to age myself, Julie, but I've known you when I was on one of those committees. We did a joint presentation of ACRO, something on registration practices or transcript. I, I don't remember everything, but Julie, you and I really go back many, many years. And finally, I got to uh, say hello to my good friend, Kristen Schmiglisi. Kristen, I met her. That, she was my first person I met when I joined uh, uh, IACRO, and she was at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign and everything, and she moved on to become a dean and everything. So it's good to see you again, Kristen, and hope all is well. So I think I spoke enough and everything, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle FC. If you have any, uh, any quick introductions before we go right into Chris to do his uh, first present, to do the first presentation. 
Michelle, anything you want to add to this presentation or discussion or no? Uh, just a little bit. So thank you very much, Jerry. It's always a pleasure to be able to see you and, and collaborate with you on things. Um, I think before we move to Chris's video, I think we're going to sneak in uh, a video that Steve Smith uh, made um, that talks about the guide and I think it will speak for itself. So I think we'll start with that. And then after that, we'll go straight into the first um, presentation from Chris. Sound good? Yes. Perfect. It's funny when, when Chris showed me this, uh, he and I spoke a week or two ago and I saw this video, it's outstanding. And how he did it, he just did it himself. He gathered the props and everything and uh, um, it, it's wonderful. So, uh, and before, one other thing before we started and we turned it over to uh, Chris and everything, I do wanna let you know that Kristen's gonna be our facilitator, taking your questions, taking your answers and everything, uh, helping move things along. So Kristen, that's gonna be your role. So. Today, we're going to start with um, Chris. I think you're ready to roll. Do it, guy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session on the association activities from ACRO's state and regional guidebook. My name is Chris Huang, and I'm the author of this chapter. I currently serve as the registrar at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, and have been involved with my state chapter, Illinois, having served as district chair, professional activities officer, and past president. The goal of the chapter 
as the title indicates, is to highlight the different activities going on at the state and regional levels. In putting the chapter together, I used my own experience. I reached out to presidents at other state and regionals and did some research by visiting state and regional websites. The most common activity is the annual meeting or an annual conference. However, since not everyone can attend the conference, it's important for the state and regional to have other activities to help its members grow professionally. There are three activities that I would like to highlight from the chapter, workshops, webinars, and mentoring. For workshops, they tend to be shorter than the annual meeting, typically one or two days. And the content or topics are usually focused for a specific audience. For example, Wisconsin ACRO has a two-day veterans conference for those that administer veterans benefits at state and federal level. Carolina ACRO offers a workshop for new admissions counselors going over admissions counseling 101, strategies for planning recruiting trips, and ways to stay in touch with students. For Illinois ACRO, we offer a spring district meeting geared towards administrative support staff who often can't go to conferences and don't have much opportunity for professional development. Each, each chair is given a $500 budget to plan the event. However, we do not pass on the costs to those who attend, it's free. And I see some cost consciousness at other um, state regionals, such as Ohio Agro, who has their summer institute every other year at a state park instead of a hotel or a conference center to keep costs down. So that's a little bit about workshops. The next activity um, that I see are webinars. And the only state regional that I could find that offers webinars is PACRO, Pacific Agro. They typically have webinars three or four times a year. And the neat thing about webinars is that it can be recorded and posted online so that members can look at the content at their leisure or on demand. And given what we experienced this year with COVID and virtual meetings and Zoom meetings, I'd expect that we'd get more content similar to webinars or others such as maybe a, a podcast or other technological uh, activities. And finally, mentoring is uh, another activity I just want to highlight. Carolina ACRO offers a mentoring program where it pairs new professionals with more seasoned professionals. They have a committee that oversees this, and uh, in order to serve as a mentor, a person needs to have at least five years experience. What's neat about this activity is that it's a good way to introduce new members to the mission of the association, but also can serve as a pipeline for future leaders or uh, people to get involved in the association. So those are some of the activities that I just want to highlight from, uh, from the chapter. I'd encourage you for more information to look at the leadership uh, session uh, or chapter and also the conference planning session and chapter as well. Thank you for taking some time to visit with me today and I hope you have a great day. So, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, just quickly, Michelle, um, are we going to take questions now or do them after it's all finished? I think the plan was to get through all of the videos and then we'll have the live Q&A after that, although people can start typing their questions in the chat. That would be fine. Thank you so much. Okay. You bet. Uh, well, now I look forward to uh, presenting uh, Carrie Jeffers, who's going to talk about leadership development. So, Carrie, take it away. Greetings, fellow ACRO colleagues. I'm Carrie Jeffers, Registrar and Director of Enrollment Services at Macomb Community College in Michigan, and I co-authored the Leadership Development Chapter of the ACRO State and Regional Guide, along with my colleague, Mary Kincannon, University Registrar at Texas Christian University. I have been highly involved in Michigan ACRO, having served on many committees, planning workshops, as well as planning the annual 2012 conference. I also served on the leadership track from 2010 to 2015, which for Michigan ACRO is comprised of the leadership sequence of vice president, 
president-elect, president, and past president. I can relate firsthand to the many challenges, frustrations, uncertainties, and rewards serving as the leader of a state association can experience. I know that taking on this form of leadership at such a grand scale with the responsibility of working across state or regions with many different higher education institutions who have different expectations, structures, roles and responsibilities can seem daunting when you first start leading the association in order to provide opportunities for your members. I know that when I started my role as vice president, I was not really trained, but had to jump into the role and was looking for resources, the best way to connect with others from across my state and beyond, and the need for up-to-date and relevant training materials and documents to not only assist me with learning my roles and responsibility, but also to be a valuable resource to our membership as well. As my colleague and I sought out information, not only from our own state associations in writing this chapter, but also reaching out to other state and regional associations, we were pleasantly surprised with the vast array of resources that each association had the different approaches that each association took when recruiting and developing future leaders for their organizations, and the many similarities as well that guide our practices collectively. What you will find in the leadership chapter, we focus on the following key areas, professional development and the ACRO leadership meeting, getting and keeping people involved, the officer handbook, and board training. When assembling the chapter content, I had the privilege of reaching out to many different state and regional leaders in addition to my own experiences to provide best practices, tips and tricks that were learned through this leadership opportunity. Some key and reoccurring themes that developed from this chapter that were found to be useful to recruit, grow and retain leaders within the organization are as follows. Seek out individuals that share the vision, mission and overall benefits of being involved within the association and explain the benefits of leading in a way that your current job may not provide. This is an important message to share with the membership as we are all aware that at times with our current everyday positions, we may not be afforded the opportunity to lead as we see fit due to specific job duties. Sharing the details of responsibilities for those in leadership roles of state and regional associations may entice individuals looking for a new challenge in which their current job may not afford to have them grow in ways that they may not have thought about due to current job limitations. Set up a mentoring program of experts for new members to get involved right away. This can ensure future leader development to not only get more people involved, but have a bench of individuals to nominate for leadership positions that may become available in the future. Illinois ACRO believes that strong mentorship is key in developing and retaining leaders and has much success in transition amongst incoming and outgoing leaders by developing this mentorship program. Tap into ACRO resources and leadership as they are more valuable than you know. The annual ACRO leadership meeting is a great resource for new and even seasoned leaders to make connections, share ideas, struggles or issues that your current organization may be facing and provide an opportunity to build a resource toolkit that can assist with providing perspective and insight for leading your state or regional association. It provides a foundation and structure for the leadership track and committee work in which your own state and regional association can build from to conduct the necessary business of the organization. Reach out to other state and regional leadership to ask questions, gain perspective, share struggles or challenges, and especially resources, as not all have to start from scratch. If there are other associations with similar structures, bylaws, constitutions, and budgets, why reinvent the wheel? Provision of a strategic plan for the organization to keep moving forward to our common goal. Creating formal training, either day-long workshops or creating a leadership institute that new and returning board members can attend at one time to share roles, responsibilities, to assimilate new officers, begin to build your leadership team, accomplish the successful transition of roles, outline expectations and to understand the commitment and responsibilities that come with choosing to serve in the leadership track. Michigan ACRO conducts a one day leadership summit that is held a few weeks after the annual meeting comprised of incoming and outgoing officers, as well as their committee chairs and co-chairs to learn more about their roles. Georgia ACRO hosts a strategic enrollment management program, while Pacific ACRO has formalized Leadership Development Institute comprised of a year-long commitment to prepare others to become part of their leadership track. 
provide historical documents through the upkeep of officer handbooks that are accessible to show the evolution of the leadership roles by having updated job descriptions, reporting structures, term limits, and the like, not only in hard copy form, but using electronic means to store and retain the information for future use. Communication through various outlets to the membership to be transparent about what leadership is doing, the new directions the organization may be taking, professional development opportunities are really important so all members feel included, even if they are not part of the core leadership team. In conclusion, the leadership development chapter of the ACRO State and Regional Guide affords rich information from several state and regional associations to recruit, grow, and retain our future leaders. Know that although each state or regional ACRO may run their organizations differently through structure, specific leadership positions, and job duties, the guide is a resource providing some best practices to assist your organization with developing future leaders to keep you going strong. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Julie Felt, who's going to talk about administrative practices. So, Julie, take it away. Hello, my name is Julie Fell, and I wrote this chapter with Kelly Christman from Ames Community College. I'm an executive associate registrar at the University of Iowa. I'm also a member of ACRO and UMACRO, which is the Upper Midwest Association. I attended an ACRO annual meeting before I attended a UMACRO meeting, but after attending just one UMACRO meeting, I was hooked. I've held various positions in UMACRO, including local arrangements, working on the program, I've also been um, in the president sequence and also more recently in uh, site selection. When I volunteered to be part of this project, I really didn't know what to expect. When we went to discuss the publication at the 2018 annual meeting, I had to admit I secretly hoped I would be able to take part in the chapter about conference planning, but was happy to contribute to the, six, the section on administrative practices. Without many of these items, it wouldn't be possible to even hold a conference. Like other ACRO publications, I think this is one that will be referred to often. As you will see when you read the guide, this chapter covers some nuts and bolts items that are essential for an organized state and regional. Historians, photos, knowledge retention and business continuity, archives and record retention, association history, membership databases, and credit card services. I will touch on all the sections, but not necessarily in the order they appear in the chapter. Let's start with the membership database. The membership database makes it possible to interact with individuals and institutions. It should include contact information, membership status, committee participation, leadership roles held, and event attendance. In most associations, member directories are available via a secure login on the association website. Vended systems are used by some associations, but the majority are maintained in Excel. Responsibility for maintaining membership databases varies within organizations and executive boards, but because an association is its members, maintaining the database is essential. Credit card services allow for a convenient payment option for membership dues and conference registrations. Most organizations offer credit card payment as an option in addition to taking checks. When considering a service, the following should be considered. Transaction fees, setup time, customer support, processing time for funds, fraud protection, and also payment card industry data security standards. Let's move next to knowledge retention and business continuity. An association of members requires a structure that includes a mission, constitution and bylaws, and a board of directors, which is covered in the first chapter of the guide in more, in more detail. Uh, detailed documentation should include expectations of governing boards, officer success, succession, 
structure of committees and meetings, whether it is a handbook or a procedures manual, terms of office, timelines, time commitments by position and by committee, expectation and responsibilities for positions must be straightforward, honest and reviewed on a regular basis to avoid confusion and misinterpretation as boards and committees turn over. Photos from conferences and other associations most likely live on thumb drives and desk drawers, cell phones, digital cameras, shared drives and copies of newsletters. Some state and regionals display photos on their websites. Others link to one or more social media platforms for shared content and photos. It is not surprising that most activity occurs in the annual meeting cycle. Archives, record retention, and association histories, historians. It is important that an organization identifies their records. For example, their membership data, newsletters, journal articles, annual meeting documents, agendas, programs, minutes, etc. When creating a retention policy, each record type needs to be de defined. A determination needs to be made about the length of time each record type should be maintained, where they will be housed, plus what position or committee in the organization is responsible for monitoring that the schedule is upheld. In some organizations, there is a designated position called a historian or an archivist. In others, these duties are combined with responsibilities in other positions. For example, like the secretary or a parliamentarian. Still others have committees that share their responsibility. I was responsible for the association history section of the chapter. I learned things like when associations were founded, when they had their first annual meeting, notable accomplishments, and topics of discussion at annual meetings. For example, selective service and college credit for war training, credit from non-accredited institutions, and name changes on permanent records. I also learned things like a presentation at the Indiana Association in 1947 by IBM that said how much machines could help with registrar functions. Others documented when they moved from a speech lecture format to a workshop or breakout sessions format. I thought this was interesting because I, I've never been to a conference or annual meeting of any kind that didn't have uh, breakout sessions or workshops. These accounts are both informative and entertaining, but they also mark trends, notable events, and the impact of technology in our profession. While this was written many months ago, I couldn't help but think while preparing this presentation how important it will be for our associations to capture and document how our institutions and associations dealt with the pandemic in 2020. Virtual learning, alternative grading, virtual commencement ceremonies, um, all of these things affected st our students. Um, we were all affected by um, learning to work remotely um, and deal with students and our colleagues remotely. We're also now looking at um, very uncertain budgets. Um, our conferences are being held virtually. Um, so it, it's been a very different time for us. I expect our annual meetings to reflect on our experiences during the pandemic for, for at least um, the next year, but probably many years to come. It's, it's hard to say what other changes we might see as a result um, of the pandemic. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to being part of the discussion on this chapter. Okay, so that was the videos. Thank you so much to the ch chapter authors that put those together. 
Um, now we will start the live Q&A session and the discussion. And the hope here is that people will really share their ideas and their questions and um, do our best to try to facilitate the type of discussion that would happen um, if we were in person. So we'll try our best with that. And Kristen, if you would sure. take the lead as facilitator, yeah. that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, we do, we have a couple of questions that have come in. So we'll go ahead and start with those. Um, what I'll do is I'll just read the question. And however, you know, our panelists would like to take turns answering um, would be would be great. So um, our first, it starts with a kind of a comment, but question is, I really appreciate the mentoring engagement idea that's been shared. Um, it's a great initiative, especially during this low in person engagement time. Um, in the guide are mentoring best practices outlined. How did others outreach to potential mentors, um, especially those who might not have a lot of time on their plate, which I think we're all experiencing. So, um, yeah, I don't know if who would like to, to lead with that answer. Chris, go sure. for it. Sure. Um, thanks, uh, Jonica, for that question. Um, the guide really doesn't go much into detail in terms of best practices for mentoring. Um, for IACRO, Illinois ACRO, we actually stole, <laughs> borrowed the idea um, from Carolina ACRO when we saw that this was when I was a professional activities officer. Um, and I think part of the reason is that the reason why there isn't best practices is because it depends on what kind of mentoring really is going to be taking place. Is it going to be more career mentoring? Is it mentoring within the association? Um, or is it just mentoring just to, hey, how are things going, that type of stuff. Um, I can share a little bit of, of kind of how we handle it through I, Illinois ACRO. Um, basically, uh, it's, you know, we do have an application process for those um, who want to serve as a mentor. And sometimes we do that through, um, you know, uh, I guess through our annual conference registration, or we have a booth at our annual meeting that will just usually are staffed by uh, members of the board. And then for people who want to be a mentee, um, they can just submit a quick email to um, the Fresh Activities Officer or anyone on the board. And we try to pair up people that way um, who are in the same um, same kind of career, uh, for lack of a better word, like admissions folks with admissions folks, registrar folks with the registrar folks. Um, I think Carolina ACRO, they have a, you know, a committee uh, as part of their um, structure um, who kind of reviews I guess the applications and so forth um, so it doesn't go that that detailed into like um, like you know best practices within mentoring but I guess just to highlight one of the books that I've read before um, is from Tony Dungy he used to be the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts and he wrote a book called The Mentoring Leader and that has some really good um, resources there um, but also I would say too I mean mentoring is just also part of leadership um, for example, um, Kristen Schmigelski, who is past president for IACRO, has been a mentor to me as I've been in the past president role, um, and other people who've just, you know, been a mentor in terms of what, what we do in the association, how, how do we do it. Um, so that's just another a model there. So it, that's why it didn't go much into best practices, because it really, mentoring itself is such a huge topic, um, and there can be, and I think as Jerry said before, you know, each state and regional might do it just a little bit differently. And I don't know if there's always a considered quote unquote best practice. Um, I think best practice is whatever makes the most sense for, for your state and regional. Um, Chris, I have a question, a follow-up question for you. Is there, when you connect two people together at a conference, is there any follow-up of any sort? Is there, are there any expectations that are laid out uh, you should communicate three times sure. a year or whatever it might be or anything like I, that we don't have anything prescribed in that way um generally speaking when people are are usually wanting to have a mentor um, we just leave it up to them to see what what kind of schedule works best for them um, we do ask that they do at least touch base you know a, a couple times and um, i mean we've had it go you know good well but also had some you know uh, frustration sometimes with people who you know, have, you know, had different expectations for mentoring or other stuff too. So, um, so I mean, yeah, we do try to do it that way at the conference, sometimes having, a, you know, looking for new people um, at the state and regional um, and mentoring that way. But, uh, you know, I, the way I look at it is like, we don't want to be, we don't want to be, at least for IAC role, we didn't want to be so prescriptive um, in terms of it. But 
if you if if that's sometimes it's not bad to be pres you know prescriptive saying hey please make sure you meet three or four times a, a at least three or four times a um, a year or something like that or but I think you know um, sometimes it's good to leave it up to the the people who are involved because then you know as as the question asked you know everyone's schedules are a little bit different so um, how often they want to meet and so forth um, it's really left up to them. Very good. Okay. Um, we have another question that's come in, so I'll go ahead and ask that as well. Um, this is more along the lines of kind of, I think, bridging different um, organizations. So um, this is also from Jonica. So we have a two to three enrollment based affinity group, two to three enrollment based affinity groups in the DMV area. How do we respectfully work to collaborate among these efforts when the two year group views itself different and handles affairs differently from the state and regional? Likewise, the state and regional has more of a four year vibe. So how do you go about and what are some recommendations for bridging those groups um, to really increase the effectiveness? Anybody have maybe experience with this that they'd like to address? Hmm. I think this happens quite a bit with different organizations, uh, you know, depending upon the state and region, some may have more, you know, uh, membership from registrar versus admissions, for example. I think that that comes into play a lot. It sounds like it's more, you know, um, two year versus a four year type thing. So I don't know if anybody has experiences they want to share or maybe how do you collaborate so everybody's not duplicating efforts, obviously all trying to, we all have the same goal in mind, right? But not duplicating efforts across your state or region. I, I can just speak from my experience in leading, in leading sure. the Michigan Acro. You know, mm -hmm. we, we look at leaders and, and things like that and nominations. We try to really balance between having two-year leaders as well as four-year leaders, mm -hmm. as well as try to have a dissemination between our two years and our four years, both public and private on the four-year scale too, right? Because you have that kind of difference that comes into play because private colleges are different than tribal colleges, which are different than public colleges. And Michigan is a um, independent state, so we don't have, we're not governed by a state you know, Board of Regents, all of our institutions in Michigan are governed by their own Board of Trustees and have their own rules and, and regulations. And so I know when we're looking at trying to balance that, we try to get perspective on committee work. We try to present things at the annual conference that ascertain to both groups, both the two-year and the four-year. We provide breakout sessions based on your type, but also we try to collaborate too. So not only then we have a registrar's group that meets and it's comprised of both two-year and four-year. We're all in one room. We're having a very uh, lively conversation because regulations that come down, things that happen, they're gonna impact us all in some way. And so maybe looking at it from that perspective is allowing the opportunity for those two years, four years, public, private, however you wanna break it down to have some time to talk amongst themselves about issues that they may be facing in like terms, but then also providing the opportunity for everybody collectively to get together. I think listservs are a really good resource as well. I know in the state of Michigan, um, myself and my fellow community college registrars, we have a listserv and you know that goes wild especially during this uh, pandemic you know how are you handling this how are you handling this what kind of resources are being eliminated from your budget and i know that the four year publics have it and i know that the four year privates of the state of michigan so listservs and resources um, maybe in that venue but then also i collaborate with my four year colleagues all the time so we may be struggling with something in a two year capacity since i do work at a community college and then I'll reach out to, you know, my colleague at Wayne State University or at Central. Um, so a lot of the registrars, at least in the state of Michigan, that are four-year institution registrars started out at a two-year. And so tapping into them and resources about, you know, when you were at the community college and now at the four-year, how can you help me look at things differently when I'm struggling with enrollment, uh, transition, transfer, however that may look. So. 
I think those maybe are some ways that you could tap in collectively at your state and, and regional. Um, just start asking people. That's what I started doing. <laughs> I didn't know anybody and I just started asking people lots of different questions. Did you know you could be a part of this? Did you know you could be a part of that? Just finding different ways to collaborate, maybe that could be a, a vast resource for you to tap into within your own state or regional association. And Angela, if you'd like to speak, you're good to go. Thank you. Um, Angela Snow from Carl Samber College. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for the information. This has been really good. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, two-year versus four-year. So we're a local community college in central Illinois. We do have some neighboring four-year schools um, that normally look for traditional students right out of high school. And we've been trying to work with partnerships and agreements. I won't mention the school's name, but um, essentially they just were, they're all campus based and no online classes and they don't like to accept online classes. So what I'm getting at is this past year we've been working with them trying to do partnerships and different things with the Samson Promise and the Galesburg Promise and they just want a certain type of student. Well this is the time where we tear down the silos and we need to work together regardless if it's two-year private or two-year um, you know um, sorry two-year or four-year um, that we work together, every student's important, whether they're traditional or non-traditional or dual credit. Um, so I, I think it's time for us to all open up our minds about more online classes and how to meet the needs of most folks who are working full time, have families, and a lot of people may have been displaced with COVID-19. And um, I think that particular school has opened up after a year and a half to start working with us because you know, um, students have choices to go to school to stay in Illinois or go out of Illinois, and it's time to try to keep those folks in the area and keep them involved, you know, at their at their local schools. So I just kind of want to talk about that and the silos between two year and four year and that's important that we all work together to help our students. Well, you know, Kristen, can I talk? Thank you. You know, there are similarities that we're not bringing up that I think would be brought up. If you want to bridge schools, for instance, basic questions. I remember doing a presentation years ago, which will touch base with anybody, is how do you do more with less? It doesn't matter if you're a school of divinity, a two-year, four-year, state five, even, you know, an Ivy League, one, how are you doing more with less? Motivating staff. The COVID is a big issue right now in everything. Mm -hmm. um, how to keep the morale, succession planning. So as far as if you're looking for topics that are of common interest for others, there really are, there really are a lot in everything. You could focus on that. It doesn't have to be about FERPA. It doesn't have to be about uh, financial and everything. But there are still a lot of common topics that all of us like to hear what we do in everything. You know, um, I like to uh, bring up issues that are never brought up before, okay? You know, just... Uh, ask a person who's the facilitator of, of, a, of, a, of a session and everything, and ask how do they become a facilitator of a session. There are just lots of things we could do because it's important that all of us, in the, when I go to a session, I wanna know, is it specific or is it general? Will it, will it do a focus of a two-year school, was a four-year school or a private school? I use this story about one of my first years at ACRO. I was working at a private school in Florida, as a matter of fact, and I went to here with 8,000 students, and I went to hear the University of Georgia talk about their registration, 32,000 students. I went into the room, I sat, I said, you gotta be kidding, Jerry, you are wasting your time. They are over, way over your head. They had 48 people, I had seven, okay? Um, they were talking about budgets. I had a bare minimum and everything. So it's those type of things that you wanna make certain that the sessions you're gonna do, it's informative, they could be shared with the maximum number of people in the group and everything. And I'm gonna hush up and let more of you talk and listen. So enough from me for now. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that information. Thanks, yeah, thank you. I just, I think it's time that we, every student is very valuable and that's Everyone. how we all survive um, and, and to be a college and, and, and helping those folks. Um, continue the future. The webinar you guys presented the other day was very good as well. There's a lot of folks out there that need credentials and need to be mm -hmm. able to get employed. So um, I think with COVID, even though it's a, a unique and not a good situation with the pandemic, that this is going to give all of our chances to rethink how education is performed at two year, four years agreements and just trying to, you know, keep our kids in the states and local, um, you know, anyway, so thank you so much, everybody. 
Okay. I was just going to um, add. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Okay, just not to, if this is, but if it's, if we want to move on, that's fine. I just, two, two quick things, I guess. Um, Cause IACRO um, has kind of, I would say sometimes a similar vibe, um, but maybe what's a little bit different for Illinois ACRO is like we have um Illinois articulation initiative, which is a transfer agreement that all the state publics um, basically, and those who privates who participate in it, it's basically a common gen ed curriculum. Um, and so that's one way in which the four years and two years kind of work together uh, through different meetings. And if there's any changes to the legislature, I'm not sure that's, uh, that happens in the DMV area or something like that, but maybe not. The other thing I would say, and Jerry alluded to it, um, and I think Carrie touched on it a little bit, just, just present at some of the sessions, present sessions at the conferences about how you can collaborate or show those type of things. Um, reverse transfer credit is definitely something that uh, Jerry's very passionate about for Illinois. And um, um, that's, that could be a way for, you know, people to have win-win situations like that. So I think, you know, I would, I don't know, I, I guess you can always start with something that you can control. And so presenting a session maybe with a four-year institution um, are, are good ways to at a conference to kind of just highlight the successes and then that can spark some different ideas or just if your state and regional has uh, meetings at the annual conference, maybe that could be a joint meeting as well. But I think um, in terms of leadership, what Kerry talked about, it's good to keep that in mind. We do that for um, pres when we think about like the board for IACRO, we wanna make sure that we have enough, you know, uh, private, public, two-year, four-year, um, you know, represented on the board, uh, especially in the presidential level too. So those are just some ways to kind of, um, I guess, build some bridges. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, how about along the lines of, you know, district meetings, seminars, workshops, um, how, what are some recommendations for, well, first, how do you keep that agenda fresh from year to year? Have there been any new ideas or initiatives or what are some ways to go about uh, making sure that it's, it's not the same program every single year, obviously with different topics. And then what do you, how do you go about getting, you know, what's the best audience or what, and maybe that varies state to state, but um, what do you see as really the best audience for the workshop, seminar, et cetera, uh, attendees? Maybe Chris will kick us off since that was under his, but anybody can chime in. Well, that was a loaded question. Uh, uh, there's a lot to cover there. Um, I guess in terms of like what, what kind of topics to keep it fresh, I think it's just, um, I don't know, I guess whatever is relevant uh, to, to what your, your association, the needs of the association are. Um, not, to, not to pick on Wisconsin, but I'd imagine, I mean, I didn't research it, but since we have someone from Wisconsin on the, on the thing I figured just mentioned, like it was really intriguing to see the Veterans Conference. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that um, I hadn't heard of for Illinois ACRO. Um, and I thought, you know, a lot, that's something that's common for a lot of uh, state and regionals or that, um, that a lot of institutions in Illinois ACRO, you know, deal with. And that was kind of neat training because I think sometimes it's really more you know, just handled by the indiv institution individually. Um, but in terms of topics and, you know, so you keep it fresh for different workshops. Uh, for the, like when we do the spring district meetings, um, there's usually like a planning group that kind of works with uh, people to come up with what what is what are the topics and we have some staples that are always there like a birds of a feather a round table that sort of thing which are always pretty popular but i think just trying to think about yeah what who's the audience who's this for and uh, doing some basic research and talking with others to see what other other people are doing i don't know if i've answered the question or not but i think that's just one way to keep the content fresh mm -hmm. i would agree with chris i think in kind of a stream of thought of that jerry was talking about i think Part of it is not only what's trending now. I mean, you have your basics, birds of a feather. You need to talk about new regulations, things that are happening in your state and region. But providing opportunities for a broader audience that may not fit into one of those categories, for lack of a better word. I know like at Michigan Acro for the past couple of years, I've been doing a, I personally have been presenting on a two-point leadership type of development. Um, hey, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, let's come talk about leadership and how to be able to develop that in your own 
private, you know, your own institution collectively as an association. We did a mental health and awareness uh, session where we did yoga. Somebody did yoga, uh, how to start beginning yoga. You know, we did a whole trending on social media. How do you get up and going with social media? How do you, how do you start a LinkedIn? How do you get on Twitter? What does that even mean? And that I think creates bridges too from, um, you know, the younger generations that, you know, I always say their phone is their appendix, right? It's never out too far to, you know, the middle of us who maybe use it a lot to, you know, the more seasoned individuals that are in the organization who don't use it all the time and don't understand all these uh, up and coming trends. And so we look at it, at least in Michigan Acro, in different ways to not only just provide updates and information and things that are important, but also to provide opportunities for fun sessions to take place as well, because I think that's that breath of fresh air that maybe you're looking for to keep things real and fresh and, and updated. So keep those kind of things in mind as well. Carrie, let me, add, let me add to what you're saying. It's also important to uh, look at what you're offering, but sometimes I know we look at this at ACRO, we look at the session that we're offering, that we're offering year after year after year. Give it a break. Put it on the shelf. Okay? Seriously. The attendees want to hear unique things, something they never heard of and everything. They want to, they want to go back and, uh, to their offices, their universities, and, and feel like they've learned at least one thing at a meeting. And they could use it, learn from it, and everything. It's sort of like, you know, Leroy Roca, love the man, best friends for life. He's always talking for three or four presentations. I say, Leroy, that's too much. There's so much for you could do. It's more important to talk about other things. You know, I look at, you know, and I think a key thing I've learned over the years, and this is not my, sorry, I don't mean to talk so much, uh, Chris, Kristen, but one of the greatest things I learned uh, is to try to get people involved and make by them getting involved, it brings more of an excitement to them and others in the audience and everything. And maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm gonna present, I'm gonna present this to the, to the panelists and everything, but uh, you know, how do you get people involved? What's the number one thing? I'll give you my own, I'll give you myself personally. I was, again, it's Florida, I was introverted, shy as could be and everything, but I said, Dagnabbit, I wanna get involved with ACRO. I wanna get involved with FACRO. Remember, I was new to the state of Florida. And I remember writing an email to, I was working at a private school, to the University of Texas at Austin, to Al Murley, who's the registrar there. And I said, I'd love to do a presentation on registration, what different schools do. I remember this is the old days and everything. And I said to myself, I have no experience. I know nothing. I never been in front of a podium. I'd probably be scared as, as the Kazizards and everything. But I said, well, let me try. Not only did he tell me to, uh, yes, he'd like me to do a presentation, he said, Jerry, I'd like you to consider becoming on a committee. And the first committee I looked at was on Florida. I'm not going to that echo stuff, way out of my league and everything. But I'm just curious, are there success stories that, that Chris, you, or, or Carrie, or Julie, that you'd like to share with the group? Because I think those are the things that, you know, state and regional, that's our, our, our job, to, to raise leaders, to graze leaders, to get involved, to how do you find them? And part of our job is also to try to of course, always increase membership, things like that. But that's, that's, that's an infomercial, not on that topic today. What would you recommend that things that you would do to try to create new sessions or get people involved? The one greatest uh, suggestion that you would have that you could present to our audience. Julie, let's ask you, you've been quiet. And remember, do you remember we presenting together or on a committee together way back when? I, th I think so. It's been a long time. I know, that's what I said. I, um, I am going to just say that at UMACRO, we have never had a FERPA session where the room wasn't just overflowing. Always. So I am just going to put that out there. I mean, those are always good sessions. Um, uh, Tina Faulkner has, has done great presentations, um, you know, with for. Uh, Rhonda, FERPA yes. for us in the past and um, it's good to have people um, bring scenarios I mean th those are the the things that people like to hear but as for your question about getting people involved in new sessions I think um, sometimes that's tough but I think when um, it's just a matter of getting more people involved encouraging people to submit sessions um, 
some and sometimes I think there's maybe a fear of uh, having to commit to having to you know be on a committee or um, you know have a leadership role. I, I think people need to be encouraged to submit sessions without having to promise to do something else, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I guess I'll just add, I also think too, one thing is people think, you know, leadership or getting involved and that just means they're going to be the president or something like there's so many different definitions of leadership within an organization and we need every type of personality um, to make it happen, right? Like not everybody has to be the president. So um, I think that's also important when you talk to to membership and, and potential people that you want to, to join in and do things. No, Krista, that's a good point. That's what I was going to say, actually, is that <laughs> when I when I started out, um, this is how I met my, my colleague, Chris. We were both um, right out of college, high school admission recruiters. I met Chris on the road. We both worked for private institutions in the state of Michigan, and um, we had the same territory. So he became kind of my travel buddy, and I, I got to know Chris really well. We would, you know, go to dinner together and somehow I'd leave one high school, he'd be showing up. It was kind of uncanny how we were in sync with one another. And um, as Chris and I have moved on and, and have grown in our careers, it's been really a great opportunity for us to have that connection. But I think that's part of it is that I never imagined when someone told me back when I started as a missions recruiter, hey, you want to join this macro organization? you could just sit on this committee and be quiet and tell us your perspective as a, as a brand new admissions person, what your thoughts are and, and things like that. I, I never thought I'd ever be nominated to be, you know, the president of the organization. I don't really think that was my intention. I can't tell you how many times I, I turned down the nomination, like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. I, I haven't really presented that much. What kind of qualities can I bring? But I think it was meeting the different people in gathering from others to um, help build your own self and your confidence too. I know when I was in the leadership track at, at Michigan Acro, and I, and I still try to do this, I go out and talk to people I don't even know. I walk up to people, I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm Carrie, how are you? And what are you doing here? And, and what brought you here today? And where are you? And, and what is it that you want to do? And, you know, just getting to know people because maybe they're not going to be set to be the president or the organization but maybe they're going to lead a committee or maybe they're a wonderful presenter. And so they can get people to give you new ideas for workshops or for uh, sessions for the annual conference. And they're an idea generator. You know, we all have special talents that if it just takes somebody starting conversations to grow and to be willing to just take the time to get to know people. Um, I think that's all that goes a long way today. I really think that that's something that, you know, we need to be more in tune is, is this whole idea of relationship building and reaching out to different people who we, we don't know and be, be willing to just talk with somebody, get to know them a little bit better. And Sheena, you're good to go. I am, thank you, Mike. Um, I agree with, with what Carrie just said. I love the idea of tapping into different resources and meeting people where they're at um, in terms of their, their comfort level and their strengths. Um, some people really like to be behind the scenes and making things happen. So you need all different types of people to run a successful organization. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you highlighted on that. Um, I was asked to, to present just briefly um, to let you know some of the things I put in the chat, which were some um, events that we did in lieu of our annual meeting this past year. And, and I will be fully transparent that some of this was just kind of a trial and error. Um, we usually would have our annual session in June. And as things progressed with COVID, we recognized that might not happen. So we quickly pivoted and tried to figure out what might be a good idea. So we quickly put together a happy hour just to kind of, you know, poll people, get a temperature, but also engage um, people. Um, each week we would meet on a different topic. Um, we tried international admissions. Uh, we, of course, had records, registration topics, and um, things like that. And that developed into our um, summer series session. 
So every week for the month of June and July, we would have a, um, a topic and we tried to have as much diversity as we can and we engaged, um, I had mentioned earlier in the notes that we intentionally try to um, and have been trying to engage members um, from, uh, you know, four-year publics and privates and uh, missions and registrar places and um, we, we seem to get really good feedback um, two years and two years and four years, of course, is something intentional. Um, and I know that they have other organizations that, you know, we try not to step on their toes or, or compete with them in, in any way. But we have had some some really nice um, conversations and and events that maybe we might not typically have. So what those look like over the summer, we tried to capitalize on that. Also thinking about our goals of providing professional development opportunities um, in addition to our networking opportunities through our association. So we did things like um, we also wanted to have money come in. So we worked with our vendors. We had some vendor focus sessions. Um, you know that were all these were all virtual. We had um, um, like I said, professional development sessions um, for, you know, how to promote yourself during times of COVID. We had, um, I, I talked about international enrollment already. We had game nights that was wildly successful. Um, and everyone seemed to um, really enjoy, you know, like Carrie was saying, different types of people um, will come and attend different types of events that suit, you know, not just their area, but their level of comfort in terms of engagement. Some folks are, are more happy to attend when they know they can, you know, they're front and center people that during this time of COVID, they're, you know, they're dying inside. They just want that physical contact. And then there's some that are like, I'm so relieved. I'm so much better behind the scenes and I can kind of just, just listen, but not really participate too much. So we're trying to keep all of those types of people um, and at different levels too. Um, you know, we, we try to engage our, our high level decision makers um, and and our front level staff and our mid managers too. So it's it's a it's a big task, but um, hopefully I haven't spoken too much. <laughs> Does anybody have any any questions for me about the, what we've been doing at Cap Acro? I think there um, is one question for you for your weekly summer series. How long was each session? That's a good question. We kept them to an hour. We tried to mirror as closely as we could to what we might see, um, you know, in our in-person sessions, um, which usually would go a little bit longer, but we were also trying to contend with uh, meeting overload, which is why we felt we were seeing such low um, enrollment in some of our events that, like I had mentioned, we initially tried uh, in a happy hour setting back in April. So we were trying to fit it in there, you know, if you can meet for our, uh, a lunch and learn, um, you know, we tried to make it during that hour and we did keep it to an hour, which was always helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Uh, Angela, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, um, just real quick, when we're talking about building relationships and, and speaking to strangers, I wanted to give a shout out to um, Chris that in fall of 15 was my first ever IACO conference and I didn't know a person. I was kind of scared to talk to people. He approached me and said, you know, she get involved with IACRO, et cetera. Well, myself and um, uh, another gentleman, we got on the executive board because no one else would volunteer to West Central chair and East Central chair and it's been the best thing that I have done Nick Sanders and I and ever since then I'm going on my sixth year um, on the executive board of IACRO from West Central chair to um, communications manager and now I've presented with Jess Ray um, again we did two-year versus four-year graduations and I've presented at um, quite a few IACRO conferences and planning a spring conference um, as chair so what I want to say is that if I hadn't ran into Chris and met Kristen along the way, and they took me under their wing, encouraged me to get involved, and also I got involved with ICRU and was secretary for them and getting involved with the listservs, I probably just still be sitting in my office wondering what's going on with the world, and I feel so fortunate to have gained those relationships with some wonderful friends, and, and Jerry Montag is trying to get me involved with ACRO, and I'm kind of easing into that. Um, now, but I just, it's very valuable. And now I'm repaying the favor when I see folks that they should get involved with IACRO, ICRU, ACRO, and trying to encourage them. Um, and like Chris said, mentor and mentee. And even if there's not paperwork saying you're a mentor or mentee, but helping your other colleagues and 
keeping in communication with them, especially during the pandemic and let know you're thinking of them and, um, and the networking. So I just wanted to say I'm very much value my friendship um, with all of you. And um, I'm glad that someone spoke to me and now I'm trying to speak to other strangers when that might be uncomfortable sometimes, but sometimes you can really hit it off and um, find some good friends and find some new facilitators for sessions, um, et cetera. Excellent. Thanks, Angela. I'll send you your payment. <laughs> Kidding. Yeah. No, but it's true. I can't lie about this. I mean, you remember that. We have, I appreciate you guys. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was going to just quick, quickly just say well, just one thing. I think um, one of the things that I th I've kind of just remembered, you know, too, is like we all started somewhere. Um, you know, none of us, at least for me, I didn't dream of uh, when I was young growing up to become a registrar. And um, I'm sure a lot of people in terms of higher ed don't necessarily dream of, oh yeah, I want to be like a director of admissions or something like that. It just kind of happens. And so I think sometimes we all started somewhere and remember someone helped us along the way. So definitely paying it forward and, and reaching out. Um, and the other thing I would say too, just reminding people, everybody has something to say because each experience is unique and reminding people about that. And yeah, there's probably some people who are just going to be introverts and that's fine. Um, but then for those, the challenge might be, hey, reaching out to like, hey, would you like to co-present with me? You know, or I see this with you just to help um, people along um, if, if they do need that little nudge or push. Um, push isn't the, maybe the right word, but you, you know what I mean? Uh, sometimes it just kind of starts with a little, a little nudge um, and just, you know, and people, sometimes I think people are just so afraid, like, well, I don't, A, I don't have anything to say, or B, um, I'm so nervous, I can't do it on my own. And so having somebody walk along with them and encouraging them is good. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, associations are only as strong as, um, I guess, members want it to be, right? Um, and so that's just a reminder to people, like, it can only be as strong as whatever, you know, you put into it or whatever you get out of it is what you put into it as well, rather than just kind of be consumers. All right, I'm off my soapbox. Um, I would just like to, there have been a few ideas that have been talked about that has really got me thinking that I just want to share a few thoughts. So um, I'm the past president of WACRO, Wisconsin ACRO, and one of the things that I never quite knew how to handle well was um, wanting to encourage new people to be involved in the organization, but then not really having opportunities for them. You know, there's not, we don't, we don't do a ton of events. And so, you know, we could offer them to be on a committee to help plan the next conference. And that's fine. And that's a good opportunity, but there's only so many spots. And I did not think of, I mean, I, maybe I encourage them to do sessions, but maybe not um, proactively enough. I mean, that's a really good idea. You know, I should have just said, okay, session ideas that you want to propose, be sure to, here's the committee structure and you talk to this person or go to this website and, you know, there's lots of different ideas that can be thrown out and just give it a go. I had never thought of that. And then in connection with that, um, when Sheena was talking about the things that they've done to replace their in-person meeting, um, the virtual world might be opening up a whole new opportunity for all of us and getting different people involved that hadn't been in the past. Um, maybe there are some folks who are really into the technology and the virtual world and things like that, that they could really come up with some things that we would probably never comprehend and it would give them an idea to get involved. So, um, I'm just putting some pieces together here and I thought I'd verbalize that for others as well. So I'm done now. Thank you. <laughs> but Michelle, on that same vein, don't you think that th this movement of virtual is going to be able to reach more people too who may not have been able to attend in person due to budgets or because um, I know like in the state of Michigan, the Upper Peninsula is like its own entity, okay? And we always have the annual conference in, in the Mitten, in, under the bridge, in the troll area, we like to call it in the state of Michigan. And it is a sometimes 
eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 hour drive, if you are at the very, if you're at Gogebic Community College, which is along the Wisconsin border, you have a long way to come down to the Metro Detroit area of, of where we live and where we tend to have our conferences. And so I think this is even opening up more opportunity for maybe people who couldn't get involved to get involved and make new connections to start developing and mentoring new and future leaders in the organization too. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. One, one thing you talked about, just like, you know, the size of your state, um, Karen, uh, we have a similar thing with uh, Illinois because, um, you know, Southern Illinois is, you know, sometimes there's institutions there that are closer to like Kentucky or like Tennessee, you know, and, you know, for us, we try to rotate our annual conference uh, between Chicagoland because there's a lot of there's a lot of institutions in the Chicagoland, um, but also kind of more central so that it's feasible, right, for um, for you know those in the south uh, to to try to you know make make the trip up. But also Illinois is divided up into five different districts, um, so we have a northeast, northwest, east central, east and west central, and then southern, and then each they have like kind of representatives from each of those uh, districts. And so that's kind of another way for us to try to bring some programming uh, to them through the, 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 the spring meetings because our annual meeting is in the fall. Um, so just, just another way or another idea that people um, you know, want to maybe change their bylaws or their constitutions to update different districts because that's one of the challenges when you have a state. And I can imagine it's even more when you have a regional, um, you know, how do you reach members of in, at, at different parts of the state um, or even across different states uh, for the regionals, you know, um, so trying to have things centralized as much as possible or trying to bring the content there. But yeah, I mean, with all the Zoom meetings and so forth, um, even this idea that Michelle put together for the delivering the state regional guidebook this way, you know, it was, it was through Zoom, um, you know, it made it possible and that type of stuff. So it's definitely something to explore. For you macro, we're, a, we're North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa and Minnesota. So we're a big region um, and we rotate states now. We used to every other year try to be in the, the Minneapolis area, but that just became pretty cost prohibitive to have the, a conference in, in the Minneapolis area. Um, I hope that with these virtual conferences, I think it would be great even if we would start um, I'd hope this that that we would do this when we were meeting in person, but that we, um, you know, find ways to invite other states or other um, organizations to our to our events. Um, uh, I don't think we have to. I mean, yes, we do want to work with our own members, but it would be great to make our conferences um, available to others if they wanted to attend. For example, I always wanted to go to Missouri's, for example, or, you know, just to, or, or Illinois, just because we're so, so close, so. So, so can we discuss that right now between Michelle and Chris, and they could talk about what Illinois and Wisconsin did and everything? Michelle or Chris, you want to talk about that? What Julia's saying? Sure. Um, am I unmuted? I am, right? You are unmuted. Yes. Yeah. Chris, you need yeah. to unmute too because you were part of this discussion that night. Yeah, he has me talk about it. And it's all his doing. <laughs> um, so it was actually at one of these leadership, this leadership meeting, in quotes, that we're having now um, is a virtual version of what usually takes place in DC. And um, I went out on a limb, like people have been talking about what one should do to meet new people. Um, and I met Jerry and Chris and we ended up having a wonderful Mexican dinner one evening and we decided that we should have a partnership between our um, state and regional organizations. Um, Wisconsin had actually had one um, <clears throat> with UMACRO uh, that had been uh, very long lasting and it, it, it's, it's still going on, but lately we've been having our conferences on the same exact days so that wasn't working as well. Um, so I figured, what the heck, why not start another um, collaborative uh, partnership with another state and regional? Um, so we did, and we have uh, one person, I think it's the president or the president-elect, go to each other's conference each year. 
Um, doesn't really matter which one, it can be anybody. Um, but it's really interesting to see how other organizations do things and to be a guest and to meet people and to hear about their institutions and their organization. Um, it's just a, it's a really good opportunity and I don't think it would have to be formalized like that at all. Um, I mean, if you really wanna just try to reach out to another organization, you could always do it individually too, I'm sure. Yeah, I think what, um, what, what Michelle just said, it was a partnership that I think Jerry introduced it to us uh, based on his experience from having been at other um, ACROs and so forth. And so it's been good. I know when I went to Wisconsin's ac um, annual conference, it was good to see how, how another conference was held. And uh, when I was president elect and planning the, the annual conference, it was one where you know, because you're planning the conference, you really don't get a chance to look at different sessions. So I appreciated that to be able to kind of just be an attendee, so to speak, without having to do much planning. And so that was really cool just to share ideas in that way. So, you know, Julie, you're welcome to come anytime to IACRO. This is being recorded. So, you know, um, you can just take it's on the record. <laughs> on the record. Oh, okay, awesome. Well, we'll go ahead. We're going to switch up some topics a little bit. Um, so there may be some uh, attendees today thinking about the topic of vended uh, membership uh, products came up, whether you do it on your own or you go through a vendor. And um, I guess, uh, are there, what, what would the panel think of some consideration? Like what are the best things to consider for looking at a vended product? If you have experience um, implementing one, any tips, advice that you have, like, I wish I would have known, fill in the blank. And then of course, likewise, if we have anybody in the audience that um, wants to talk about their experience and that, um, feel free to share as well. So Kristen, you mean for um, for the organization, like a, yes. a vendor, yeah. like member, member services members, and all that for jazz. example. Okay, mm -hmm. yep, okay. Who would like to go first? All right, I, I just want to make sure I guess I'm answering, I'm understanding the questions for like vendor services, like membership type mm -hmm. things, like what do we use for a membership, so. Yeah, and do you yeah. have like, I wish I would have known whatever, I could go back in time and so like maybe advice or, or things that you'd like to pass on to others who may be sitting here considering, you know, that that would be a good route for their membership to go, the organization to go. Um, I don't know. I guess I could take a, a first try at this. Um, uh, Illinois, uh, we implemented member clicks about two years ago. Um, part of that is because I think as we looked at the at organization, our listserv was being held by Illinois State University. Um, we had a mem member renewal through uh, like one, two, three sign up, I think, and then vendor registration was in a totally different software. And so um, I don't know if it was at the leadership, but um, member clicks was something that ACRO had reached, uh, ACRO had re researched and endorsed. And, um, you know, through negotiations and so forth, mm -hmm. we were able to do that. And I think one of the things that's that's been nice there is that it's one system that has everything yeah. in it, uh, you know, event registration, renewals, um, it has a listserv feature. It also hosts our website. Um, and so that was, I think, some um, efficiencies or effectiveness type things that we could gain going from switching over. It was a little um, challenging because it, you know, it's like you already have a day job and you have, you know, as you're bringing up another um, things and migrating data and that type of stuff. But I think overall, it's been a good experience for IACRO. Um, I don't know if that's something that I wish we would have done earlier, but I think just in terms of sustainability for the organization, um, uh, it's, it's just hard. I think sometimes you want to get away from this person is the only person who knows how to do this thing um, in, in an organization to having something a little bit more sustainable. Um, and some of that also with having job descriptions or position responsibilities or talk, documentation that, that goes a long way to making it sustainable. 
Let me just add to what Chris is saying. This is a board initiative, being the ACRA board and being the VP for that group and everything. It was an initiative that we thought the state and regions could use. It was, it was they, they, they piloted with six other state and regionals and everything, with Kansas being the first and a few others and everything. And it was something that we thought state and regions could use, plus ACRA was willing to do a financial support towards it and everything, and to continue that and everything. So it's one of those things that the national office was hoping to do more for the state and regions, because that's, an important, that's important for us to do. And that's important that I make certain that all of you out there are making certain that whatever goes to me was going to ACRO, was going to the board, are listening. Because one of the key things that we need to do, we at ACRO, and I think I've learned that it also needs to go on at the state and regionals, is you're listening to what your members are saying and asking and doing or not doing and everything. For instance, I think it got brought up about, uh, Julie brought up about um, virtual member, virtual uh, meetings. I think ACRO is looking down the line. I think they, they're talking about, you know, I'm not saying what's going to go on with this year's meeting because we don't know yet and everything. But I think the idea about having annual meetings, but also having virtual meetings for people who can't go to these meetings. And, but I think that's something that, Chris, I wanted to make certain that this was an ACRO initiative. And we don't put, we don't, ACRO doesn't endorse a vendor. Okay, that's key thing to know. We don't endorse a vendor. You're on your own. We stay out of it and everything. It's, it's basically you and your state and region would offer advice and suggestions and everything. But I think that's how, Chris, we got involved with uh, member clicks. And I, I think it's doing well for our organization. And you know better than I do. I just pay the fees for NIU. That's all I do. <clears throat> is there anybody in our audience that is thinking about something new or something different? I mean, maybe you have something and switching to something else um, that you'd like to share? Lessons learned, considerations? <clears throat> Kristen, you asked the question, le lessons learned. Yeah. And I know I said I'd, I'd stimulate discussion if you want me to, but I think that's the most important thing you, you want to hear about is lessons learned. And I'll just give an example. We were looking to contract out with a, uh, a new uh, software company, not to mention names, as far as what they've done, the success they could bring my institution, the cost involved, is it an investment in everything? And I wanted to know more about schools that may have bought the products, what they did right, or more than that, I wonder what they did wrong. Or was this the best place to buy or the piece of software to buy and everything? And I'm not mentioning names and everything. It's sort of like, I'll go to a session and I'll ask the presenters whether it's um, <clears throat> software products like Ad Astro or 25 Live or, or whatever it may be, or, or, <clears throat> or Herb Jones or Johnson, any of those, the plumber company, whatever it may be. But I'm looking for more for schools that bought them or went live with something and what they would like to know before they went live with a, a new system and everything. If any of you had those types of experiences, whether it's implementing PeopleSoft or, or, or uh, <clears throat> Ban or whatever, anybody want to add to that conversation? a success or a failure, or you say to myself, I wish I would have known that before I made this purchase. Notice I give the audience, which is state regionals, which are leaders, the chance to talk. And Angela, you've been excellent in everything, way to go Illinois and everything. And I, I'd love to hear from more of you. I also love to hear things I can bring back to the board from these meetings, so take it away. Can well, I was trying. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry, you go ahead. I was trying to get Kim Jasper to uh, speak up here uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, she's typing. Um, we use Star Chapter, and as she explains in the chat, we it's it's a good product. We're happy with it. Um, we decided to change our uh, membership structure, uh, the fees, and how we determine what the fees are and stuff because it didn't work really well with the software, and we wanted to change it anyway. So that was not a huge deal. So I think we're happy with Star Chapter overall. We went we went with them um, before um, Acro was really involved with member clicks and the like, and plus they don't endorse them anyway. So, but one problem that we've been having is that every year we have this issue with PCI compliance and we get mm -hmm. caught between excuse me, of the credit card vendor and Star Chapter. And the credit card vendor tells us that 
we aren't um, PCI compliant, but Star Chapter is, and we keep trying to tell them, but Star Chapter is, <laughs> and that's what we, that's who we use, and it's, it's like we get caught in the middle. I have seriously wasted probably 50 hours trying to get this resolved last year, and now it's starting all over again. Um, and since we aren't having a conference and I don't, or, or in-person conference, and I don't think we're um, charging people for the virtual um, thing that we'll be putting together, it's not super critical that we get it figured out, but it's really, really annoying. And I've told our contact at Star Chapter, I'm like, um, <laughs> we just might go to member clicks. You know, I know this isn't your problem that we're going, that we're having these issues with the credit card vendor, but nobody else, is, you say that we're the only customer you have that has these issues and now we're having it again. So we may just, I mean, I don't want to ask people to go through another whole re-implementation because Kim and our member services person spent a lot of time on it, but um, we might integrate to something else. I don't know. Or to, to move to something else. I, yeah, as Kim said or asked, does anybody have any advice or been through anything remotely close to this? Yeah, this is Mike from Acro. Um, it's just strange to me anyway. Uh, before we made our switch to Salesforce, there were certain areas where we had to be PCI compliant, but they almost entirely had to do with stored credit card numbers. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that we moved to our current pay processor and our current commerce system is that we don't ever really know the credit card number that's going through. We might be able to find a record of who entered it and when, but we could never actually find all of that credit card information. Um, so the PCI compliance just shifted away from us. So it's just confusing that you have, that there's that disconnect and I don't know if you'll find any good advice here. It just, it's, it just seems like an unheard of problem. Um, I've never heard of it anyway. Yeah, it is. It's very odd. I completely agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> but here we are again. So. Well, best of luck moving forward. Thanks. Yeah. Well, and I think kind of to that, related to that, but maybe an overarching theme with just vended products and implementation is, we all have, um, everybody has a, a day job, right? So <laughs> considerations of time spent doing your job, but then also, uh, you know, working with your professional organization and, and that striking that balance there is really important to consider. And don't forget you have a family too. <clears throat> That's my wife always says, Jerry, always remember who signed your check. And are you, they come first. Acro second, and when I echo well, whenever Chris calls me and everything, so it works out well. It's not your wife that signs your check? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question about member clicks. Does it, and it, 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 this question gets to something that I've been thinking about, and that's um, organization handbooks and keeping information for um, people who will follow and training people. Um, is there a mechanism in member clicks to be able to store documents like a handbook and things like that? For those of you who use member clicks. This is yes. Angela Snow. Um, I work with Chris and Kristen on member clicks and I currently use member clicks for our Chronicle newsletter. Um, that we do four times a year. Um, in fact, I have it up. I wish I could share my screen with you so you could see it, but um, we can create forms. I can do that can... for you. You can? Yeah, okay. I'll move to a panelist. So one second. All right, so you now. That'll be great. I haven't seen it, so it'd be super. All right, so Angela, you should now be a panelist. Okay, just a second here. Let me exit full screen. Which screen can you see? Can you see the left side now? Uh, you'll have to initiate the share. On your end. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no just problem. a second. Share screen. But once that's uh, up, we'll let you know. Right. Here we go. Okay. 
I clicked it. Is it coming up yet? Can you guys see member clicks? Yeah, okay. So um, just very briefly, okay, um, we can add our members in, we can do invoices, we can have retirees, honorary, et cetera. And then we can create forms, okay? So what I do, um, I go to the contact center, just as an example, um, and this is, um, Chris was really big on um, us being able to track our chronicle and how many people are really reading it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have names there. Um, but this has been great because we can track it out. So what I'm saying is that I can um, show a previous message that I created here with our fall chronicle that we just did and I can work on it and save it. And then I can send it out to a test and then I can also be able to tell um, what was sent out and at what time and we can track that. And we also have our listserv through here now, which is fantastic. So then when we have our e-list, you can see the communications going out and they're complete. We can do it for forms, we can do it for invoices, but then also we can pull up our um, member clicks uh, for our listserv. So if people are asking the same question over and over again, it can track how many replies you have on your listserv. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it took a lot of work uh, to set it up. You know what I mean? In a big group effort, but uh, Chris has done a good job um, with the executive board with us to cross train each other. So not just one person knows something if something happened to somebody and if someone needs to access something, if they have a login, then they can get in there and access what documents or what things need to be taken care of for the IACRO um, association. Go ahead, Michelle, you're thinking. Are you no, I'm just listening. Thank okay. you. So yep. did, did I answer any of your questions? We can store invoices, forms, everything. Yeah. It, it's, you know, when I first started, I was a little bit nervous, but we've been kind of making up our own manuals and we had really good training too. But once you get used to it, um, you know, it, it's simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, but um, it's been a very good choice, I feel, for IACRO and having everything in one spot and not a bunch of different vendors. Thank you for letting me share my screen. Any other questions on member clicks? Does it track open rates on the messages you send to your members? Uh, for documents, like if I sent out the Chronicle and how many people looked at it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Angela, for that. Mm -hmm. Mike and Jerry, do you know, do a lot of the state and regional organizations use either member clicks or another vendor product like that? Or are a good chunk of them still manual as far as you know, you know, spreadsheets and the like? Mike, Mike I'll let you answer that one. Yes, yes. You, so, yeah. um, I know we have maybe I don't know, probably close to 10 state and regional organizations are currently taking advantage of uh, our member click software, which for those of you that weren't with us before or for a, a few months ago, we did a special member clicks webinar. Uh, we are offering that for free. Um, so ACRO covers the yearly costs and the startup uh, costs as well. Um, the, the real investment on your part as uh, Angela kind of alluded to is the is the time investment, um, you know, because you'll have to get trained up on it and convert all of your documents and everything. But from what we've heard, and one of the reasons that we decided to kind of go with uh, uh, subsidizing that platform as opposed to any other one is because we heard very positive feedback about it from most people. But I know not everyone uses it. I think, like I said, we have around 10 currently that are doing it. Great, thank you. Let me look at my list. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about, I know we'll, we'll be close to time soon, but um, I guess from a story and archive perspective, we'll go that route. Um, you know, there's so much uh, digital um, these days. I guess, how do, how do, how should organizations, I guess, evaluate that they're doing things 
kind of correctly or they're, they're capturing what they should be capturing. I know there's a lot of good information out there, but I guess is a, a recommendation to do like a, you know, have your archivist or your historian do a once over. But I think in such a digital world and even now, so, you know, um, everything is really electronic, just making sure you're capturing that on a flash drive or what are some, I guess, best practices or things that maybe organizations have done to maybe improve their process with um, archive gathering. And that could be official documents or that could be the fun stuff like pictures from conferences and things like that. Does anybody have any ideas or, or things that they've implemented recently? Uh, maybe if they've seen somebody new roll onto the board into that role too, that could be. That's a good question. My only answer is that we having a vendor product like that helps with that information and that was our big change recently so I agree I think this a product like this would be very helpful for you know keeping those things I wonder if it also alerts you to um, like if there's something that needs to be updated annually or every three years or something mm. Our, our archives are still held at the University of Illinois, <laughs> Urbana-Champaign, <laughs> in like just true legit archives. And our archivist just would actually bring stuff over there to put it in the archives. But in terms of electronic things, um, I mean, things that are created within member clicks are stored there. One thing that we did this last year uh, that I thought was pretty neat, uh, one of our vendors for the annual meeting is uh, Live Touch, and not to endorse one or another, but um, one of the things in terms of our contract, and I think we actually got this idea from Wisconsin Acro, so I hope I'm not giving away any trade secrets here. Uh, but in exchange for a vendor, normally we, you know, we have a vendor rate, you know, when, uh, at different levels and so forth that they can sponsor. But in lieu of, uh, you know, charging them that sponsorship, they would just take pictures for us at our annual meeting. And then that was really cool because then they just threw it on a Google Drive, shared it with us, and then that's the way that IACRO had kept, um, for, at least for this last conference last year. And it worked out really well because we were always trying to find someone to take pictures and stuff that's, I think from, from my perspective, sometimes then when you're doing something at a conference, then you're not able to participate. And I really want people to try to participate in the annual meeting as much as possible. So that was kind of a nice thing to, I wish we could have done something earlier um, because the pictures are really great. They have a high quality camera. Um, and they send you the link on Google Drive. You can share that with whomever. Um, and then they can download different pictures and stuff like that. So that was a, a neat, neat trick um, that we learned from Wisconsin. Yeah, all good things. And I noticed in the chat, um, there was a comment about that, um, that not everybody has that, that role, you know, that works with the board or position on the board or with the board. So, um, you know, as you're, you're looking at your, your own organization, maybe something to consider, um, you know, however that's structured, you know, up to you and probably depends, but to have somebody who kind of takes the lead on um, all of those things, I think is, is also really good too. So. Uh, let's see here. What else can we talk about? Any other topics that we haven't covered, folks, that you want to try to get some questions in on or discussion in on? If I, I'm sorry to talk so much today, everybody. Um, Angie from Sandberg, but the, the big hot topic right now is electronic transcripts. And I enjoyed the ACRO webinar on that the other day, and I've done some due diligence of research. But it appears that the National Student Clearinghouse and Parchment, since they merge with credentials, are the two um, games in town, and we're merging with Parchment. But I was just curious to see what other folks' thoughts were that were on the call as far as what software works or don't. We currently use Parchment Lite. We don't use the the premium. And I'm curious how schools feel maybe um, about parchments since we're switching to that and, and how they like the software to send and receive because we only receive currently until we merge over. Uh, 
there are um, some I, comments in the chat about liking parchment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Uh, according to parchment, they said about 90% of folks are moving to parchment, about 10% to the clearinghouse. Um, so it sounds like they've got the largest network, but I was just curious since I haven't actually um, used parchment. Thank you, Sheena. <laughs> So, and, and also Carl Samber College is moving to Slate. Um, Zoe that used to work at University of Illinois with um, Kristen, um, they're moving to Slate and it's been a best decision because recruit with uh, Aleutian was not going so well and was sending out communications without our authority. So um, we're mm -hmm. almost done fully implementing that. So um, looking forward to having Slate. So thank you everybody. Can I, Michelle? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask two questions that are, the, uh, <clears throat> that are focused on you and your role as chair of the St. Regional Committee. Um, first, I'm going to ask all the people in attendance at this uh, meeting to ask, you know, the St. Regional Guide, like we're saying, is going to be a, a thing that's going to continually grow and grow and grow. There are things that were not written, there were nothing researched on in other areas. For instance, I asked my own question, <clears throat> what is the policy of other state and regionals as far as travel policy for the president, for the, for the board, for meetings and everything, who covers what, what is the, you know, and there's so many other things. So I'm asking, this is, I'm just saying to Michelle, that if you have any ideas for improvement or additions to the uh, guide and everything, Michelle is your contact person as chair of the state and regional committee and everything. So Michelle, you and Tex could take that on and everything. And I'm gonna, um, and since this is my third and I'm going off the board this year and everything, I'm gonna ask this question I always like to ask. You had to brag about one thing that your state or regional does, that you're the best in the country. You could go, you could stand up at a podium in the, in the gym, in the auditorium, in the Lincoln Philharmonic, whatever it may be, seriously. What's the number one thing that you think your state and regional does, which we all can learn from, that doesn't have to be costly, doesn't have to be techno technologically oriented, whatever. That's something that could be more on a street level that you could, you know, you come back at a meeting. Like I always say, when I come back from a meeting, the number one thing I tell people to do is come back with more colleagues, more friends, more contacts. I've done that over the years and it's a pleasure to have and work with and everything. And my institution loves, they say, just ask your friends. And I get the information around the country. But what's the one, that's my favorite thing, but what the one thing you say, you, you would brag about, about your state and region that you do, that we could all learn from. Again, the, the, the guidelines are cheap, free, reasonable, easy to implement, no technology. You can even do it in a, in a, in a, um, a COVID environment. So don't all flood Kristen now, trying to get into the chat room and everything, but just go for it. <laughs> And don't be shy. Well, I will start. I will say for WACRO, and I get no credit for this whatsoever because this is not my ballywick. But um, we we tend to have a lot of fun. The recreation or the the oh, what's it? What am I trying to say? We have a certain amount put aside for every conference for a fun event of some sort. And we've had like beanbag tosses and um, Jeopardy games and just some really, really fun games and things to do that are just a riot. I mean, the beanbag competition that we had at one of our last conferences was hilarious. And we had a costume party and it was, yeah. So we have a lot of fun in Wisconsin, Acro. <laughs> Nobody else? I usually add Facebook friends. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at a list of attendees. There are a few of them on here right now and everything. <clears throat> well, if nobody's going to take your bait, Jerry. No, I will. I, know I will. <clears throat> Jerry, I'm going to ask you, you're an outgoing, friendly person. I've known you for a good many years and everything. What are some things that I, I you know, sorry, I forgot about what Macro does and everything. But yes, I know you guys are all around the Normally you're meeting in Frank and Youth or whatever, and this year you're virtual. I'll be there and everything. But what are some things that you think Macro does that you'd like to brag about? Well, I think 
Well, I, I like to echo Michelle. We have a lot of fun, but we do a lot of themes. So I know the year that I planned the annual conference, it was a cowboy hoedown theme. Okay. And so we encourage people to come dressed up in their best uh, cowboy, cowgirl, whatever it's affiliated gear. And we have a theme night dinner where we, uh, I remember that night we served, you know, fixings for that, that cowboys would have and, and things along that line. And we had a little contest and then the membership gets to vote. Um, the year after our Great Lakes Conference that we had with Ohio and Indiana, it was a homecoming. So we had a homecoming theme and we had the registrars versus the admission folks. We had a pretend football game. We had cheerleaders. We had a homecoming dance. I wore my daughter's prom dress and uh, it, was, it was great. We had people that wore their prom gear from the 60s, 70s, 80s, oh, 90s, the current. I mean, it was this big, this big ordeal. Yeah, we had a little flag. Now it wasn't flag football, but it was like that little paper football. Mm -hmm. And so the registrars would nominate their team to go out and play. And so we do a, we do a lot of theme oriented uh, events at, at Michigan Afro. And I think that just brings people to a whole different level of friendly competition, but also just seeing people, how creative they can be and get them out of their comfort zone when you continue to see people from across the state or your region on a professional basis. It kind of lowers those boundaries down a little bit and like, hey, that, they're, they're, they're like a real person. They're a lot of fun. Oh my goodness, I can't believe they came dressed like that. We had a 20s theme where everybody was dressed like flappers and, and gangsters and stuff. So I mean, it's, it, we, we have uh, we have some type of themes. We had a murder mystery night. So I mean, it was a lot. It, that's something that we we like to do at Michigan Acro, and we have a lot of fun doing it. That's neat. All right, I guess I should represent Iacro here and speak up, right? Um, so yeah, we have fun too. We have a costume party as well, um, and it's been fun because our annual conference is usually around Halloween, and so we have kind of like a. a song and dance and that type of stuff too and um but I, I you know i would also say uh you know yeah and i went to michelle's uh, and she had a great fishing theme so i remember that um seeing all the different uh costumes and so forth so those are always fun and that's always great because you know in terms of connections and collegiality i think those are important to make those relationships at the annual meetings or other things for IACRO, I would say, I think one of the things that I'm really proud of, I think, is that we are very co a collaborative bunch um, and that we kind of work well together um, and sharing ideas and, uh, and other things. I think that's one of the things I'm very proud of. And just we're really supportive of ACRO. Um, I know that uh, a lot of, um, there's a lot of good leaders that, that ACRO and, and the board and that type of stuff and Jerry represents our state well as uh, very and so appreciative of, of that but um i would say you know we like to have fun but we also i say would say like we just we like to stay involved and maybe that's just because we're like second city or something like that um but i don't know i don't really know where i was going with that but we do like to have fun and we like to collaborate i would say those are the things that i appreciate mm -hmm. about um, my state and regionally Anybody else want to share about their experiences? I agree. It's you come away um, from the conference just revived with new ideas. Hopefully, you know, I start writing them down your first day back at work after a conference, and then you kind of see where it goes from there. But at least you can always reconnect with somebody. Like, oh wow, you know, we were talking about this. You know, can we talk a little bit more and get more information? Everybody's so willing to help one another, which is really nice to see. I got to ask one final question. Illinois has a state university registrar group and we have a community college group. I could just talk about the state universities. I know we meet twice a year, but now with COVID, we're meeting virtually every other week. You know what? It's a pleasure. We just share information what's going on that's pertinent to state universities. And I'm curious if you have these types of arrangements in your state regionals where it's just, you know, well, maybe with the regionals, maybe a little little challenging. I could see sacro and, and tacro and, and macro. It's too big. But what about within your state? Do you have like there's 12 state universities in Illinois? We meet well, besides twice a year. Now we're meeting every other week. Well, the community colleges meet regularly at the annual meeting. But I'm not, and then the private. I'm not certain. But do you have those types of initiatives? Because those are what I call something that's easy, uh, cost effective, and gives you intrinsic and, and extrinsic values. 
Anybody have anything like that that they'd like to share? Yeah, Jerry, we, we do that in Michigan. Um, the community college registrars get together quarterly and we rotate and each community college hosts. So we get to see somebody else's college. You know, you hear about other institutions in your state, but you may not have the opportunity to travel there. So we do that quarterly. And unfortunately due to COVID this year, we weren't, be able, we weren't able to do that. Um, but we, our listserv is active. Like just since I've been sitting here, I've gotten 22 emails from my colleagues right now, <laughs> just about things that are happening in our state. How are you handling this? And then from that group, we have more of a core group um, that talk because we're similar in size and situation, uh, CIS systems, things like that. But our uh, 15 public universities in the state of Michigan, they get together as well. And they normally go to the fun part of the state, like they get to go to the West. You know, Jerry, you've been to those. You know, I guess, I guess what I'm looking at is something that right now, I think it's so important that the, yeah. our state university we talk left and right. Oh and yeah, I, I think it's probably more now that we're virtual because, you know, how are you handling this and this and this? And, and I think checking in on one another on your mental health too is, is key. It's yes. more than just, professionally what's going on, but mentally, how are you handling being in isolation? Like most of us work in isolation day in and day out now, and you're disassociated from your staff and you're in back-to-back -back meetings because now it's easier to actually be in back-to-back -back meetings because you don't have to travel across campus or, or physically try to get to another building, right? So it's it's a different type of, I, I would agree, you're, you're probably more connected now because we're kind of all going yes. through it together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, we are about at that time. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I'll kick it over back to Michelle um, for any other final thoughts and uh, our conclusion. Hey, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day to um, attend this. We hope you found it helpful. Um, it's not the same as being in person, but I think the benefit of being able to have more people participate and here some of the ideas that are shared um, really balances that out. So uh, we hope you found it well worth your time. We have one session left uh, next week, the conference planning one. Um, so I think that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm taking these workshops and trying to learn from them and thinking about what else we might be able to do as a state and regionals committee and maybe provide these types of offerings um, along the lines of what some others were talking about with virtual um, programming for their state and regional organizations. So I will try to be sending out some communications to folks and we'll see what we can put together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jerry, any last words? No, what a great group. What a great group of, uh, what a leader <laughs> we have in the show. What a great group of presenters and facilitating everything and what a great audience so you can tell that i'm a shy guy and everything but what the heck life is short and everything but also anybody want to be a facebook friend you could be my facebook friend more than happy to or if you need help with something i'll let you know so i think i have nothing else to say michelle congratulations keep up the great work and to all of you keep sharing issues or ideas or topics that could be written in future um uh, and future um, state and regional guides, which will be important. As remember, we're doing, we do sessions on, um, what do you call it? You know, what's that word? When you leave and you, you know, I forgot. Succession what planning. Succession. Right. You need to do the same thing for uh, chairs of state and regional committees and future ones and everything. So think ahead. Bless you all. Thanks, Mike. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.